In the beginning, railways were conceived as open roads, like the turnpikes. Policemen were employed to regulate the traffic where required. However, as locomotives and rolling stock developed and became heavier, it was realised that some effective means of spacing the trains was required. A system of time interval was developed using line-side signals. The railways soon found to their cost that this system had inherent dangers and that a space interval, or block, was what was really needed. The invention of the electric telegraph afforded reliable communication between signal boxes and this led to the introduction of a system that was to become the basis of railway signalling for over a century, the absolute block system. Let's have a look at how the absolute block works. The signal box at A has a home signal and a section signal. The section of line between these two signals is known as station limits. In advance of this section signal, the line as far as the home signal at B is known as the block section. Only one train may ever occupy this block section at any one time. This then is the basis of the system. As at A, the line between the home signal and the section signal at B is also known as station limits. Of course, either A or B might have more than two stop signals for each line. In such case, station limits extends from the outermost home signal to the section signal. Each signal box has a distance signal. This cautionary signal, placed at a braking distance from the home signal, can only be cleared when all the stop signals for that line have already been cleared. Now let's have a look at how a train is actually signalled on the absolute block. The signalman in the rear calls the attention of the signal ahead, one beat on the block bell. When this call attention is acknowledged, the signalman in rear offers the train forward by bell code. If the signalman ahead is able to accept the train, he repeats this bell code and turns the commutator of his block instrument to line clear. This indication is repeated in the rear signal box. The signalman there is now able to clear his section signal for the train to proceed. When the train passes into the block section, the rear signalman sends the train entering section bell code to the signalman in advance, who acknowledges and turns the commutator to train on line. The train has now arrived within station limits of the signal box ahead. Only when the train has passed the clearance point or overlap as shown in the absolute block regulations and the signalman has seen the tail lamp and thus knows the train to be complete may he call the attention of the signalman in the rear and give the train out of section bell code restoring the block instrument to the normal position. He may now accept another train. If the block section would be so long as to unduly extend the headway, a special signal is used to divide the section into two parts. This signal is called an intermediate block home signal and is usually controlled from the signal box in the rear. An intermediate block home signal can be identified by a rectangular white plate 
bearing a vertical black band. The system of signalling known as absolute block is normally associated with mechanical signals of the semaphore type, although in many cases colour light types are employed, particularly for distant signals. Let's begin by looking at some mechanical signals. Most common are the semaphore types known as upper quadrant. The signal arm is horizontal when the signal is at danger, or in the case of a distant signal at caution, and is raised through 45 degrees when the signal is cleared. A less common type found principally on the western region is the lower quadrant type, the arm of which is horizontal when the signal is at danger or caution, and is lowered through 45 degrees when the signal is cleared. Mechanical signals are usually operated by a system of wires and pulleys and the actuating levers in the signal box are interlocked with each other as well as with those operating the points so as to prevent conflicting movements being signalled in error. There is also some electrical locking, such as the lock on the section signal lever, preventing movement of this lever if the block indicator is not showing lying clear. Where such electrical lock is fitted, the signal lever has a white band painted on it. Over the years, various devices have been employed to assist in reminding the signalman of the presence of a train. One of these is the simple track circuit, denoted by a white diamond sign attached to the signal post. Let's look at the simple track circuit, one of the most important developments in the history of railway signalling. A low voltage current is fed to the running rails by a battery. This current flows along one running rail as far as an insulated block joint. From here the current flows through the coil of a relay, then back to the opposite running rail through which it returns to the battery. While the current flows through this circuit, the coil of the relay is energised and the track occupation indication in the signal box shows the track to be clear. When the first pair of wheels of any vehicle passes on to the track concerned, the current, instead of flowing through the whole circuit, will take the short route and the relay will become de-energised. The track indication in the signal box will now show occupied. If, for any reason, there is an interruption in the flow of current through the track circuit, caused, for example, by a broken rail, the track indication will show occupied. It is therefore a fail-safe system. If the relay is used to switch the aspects of a signal placed in the rear of the track circuit, we have a simple automatic signal. Now the occupation of the track circuit is not only indicated in the signal box, but the signal is automatically restored to danger behind the train. When the train clears this track circuit, the relay will become re-energised and the signal will, once again, show a proceed aspect. Here we have the basis of modern track circuit block signalling. Every signal section comprises one or more track circuits. Signals are controlled by the passage of trains if they are automatic, or restored to danger by the train if they are controlled. Because the occupation of each track circuit is visible to the signalman, it is no longer necessary to offer trains forward as in the absolute block system. They are simply described forward to the next signalling centre. As with the simple track circuit, the system is fail-safe. Any interruption in the flow of current through the track circuit will result in the replacement of the protecting signal to danger. Although mechanical signals are still to be found in some track circuit block areas, the system is almost universally associated with multiple aspect colour light signalling. This may be of the two, three or four aspect arrangement according to line speed, signal spacing and headway characteristics. Let's have a look at the sequence of aspects displayed by each of these arrangements. In four aspect signalling we have a green aspect lying clear. 
Two yellow aspects, preliminary caution, expect to find the next signal exhibiting a single yellow. The single yellow aspect, caution, tells us to expect to find the next signal at danger. The three aspect arrangement has no provision for displaying preliminary caution, the sequence being green, one yellow, and red. Certain areas have multiple aspect signalling of the searchlight type. These may be of the three or four aspect arrangement. Two aspect signalling does not provide for a cautionary aspect on stop signals and therefore these signals are preceded by a two aspect colour light repeater sighted at braking distance in the rear. The colour light repeater displays either a green or single yellow caution aspect. Where any stop signal cannot be sighted at a distance by the driver, perhaps because of curvature or an overbridge, a banner repeater signal is provided. Most of these are of the mechanical type, although some have been replaced by the fibre optic display. When the black band is displayed at 45 degrees, the signal ahead is showing a proceed aspect, either cautionary or clear. When in a horizontal position, the signal ahead is at danger. Now let's take a look at how signals are identified. The automatic signal, the one controlled purely by the passage of trains, is identified by an oblong white plate bearing a horizontal black band. The semi-automatic signal, which is normally controlled by the passage of trains but can be controlled from a signal box or ground frame when required, is identified by an oblong white plate bearing a horizontal black band above which is the word semi. The controlled signal carries only a plate indicating the signal box prefix letters and the signal number. Finally, the colour light repeater is identified by a plate bearing the number of the signal which it repeats, accompanied by the prefix D or suffix R. Lines operated by track circuit block may be unidirectional in the usual way, or they may be reversible, that is to say, signalled in both directions. A further development of this capability is where a double track main line has each road signalled for bidirectional running. With the provision of trailing and facing crossovers at regular intervals permitting trains to cross from one running line to the other, a high degree of operating flexibility is assured. The signalling philosophy of British Rail is that of route control rather than the speed control system used by the railways of continental Europe. Drivers of trains are advised of the route over which they will be running and this route information is given in three different ways. Firstly, in mechanical signalling by semaphore arms placed at different heights on a bracket or gantry. The highest semaphore arm routes trains to the main line. The divergent routes to the left and right are signalled by semaphore arms in descending height. Secondly, by means of groups of five white lights above the main signal head, angled to conform to designated positions. Let's have a look at how this works. The junction indications are given position numbers, so starting at the top left we have positions 1, 2 and 3. Then from the top right, positions 4, 5 and 6. With a proceed aspect and no junction indication, the train is routed via the main line. Junction indication position 1 routes the train to the first diverging track to the left, position 2 to the second left, and position 3 to the third left. 
Junction indication position 4 routes trains to the first diverging track to the right, position 5 to the second and position 6 to the third. Obviously, where a junction signal is required to indicate more than seven routings, the maximum possible with standard junction indications, an alternative system must be employed. The so-called theatre type route indicator is capable of exhibiting an almost unlimited number of numerical or alphabetical combinations. A common location for this type of junction indicator is at the approach to large stations having a number of platform lines. The most modern form of theatre type indicator uses fibre optics to give a bright, high-resolution dot matrix display. This technology has also been used at some locations to replace standard five white light junction position indications. An R or RA indication is also given at some platform starting signals to give authority to the driver to start the train. In colour light signalling, where a divergent route is set which is subject to a speed which is restrictive by more than 10 miles per hour, a system of approach release is applied to the junction signal. In this system, the junction signal will not exhibit a proceed aspect until the approaching train has occupied a berth track circuit for a given interval of time. By this means, the retention of the junction signal at danger controls the speed of the train as it approaches the divergent connection. A more recent development has been the introduction of flashing yellow aspects to regulate the approach speed of trains to high-speed divergent junctions. The flashing yellow aspects will only be displayed where the divergent route is set. Let's go back and have another look. Where four aspect signalling is employed, the advance warning of approach to a divergent route will be two flashing yellow aspects. The next signal will display a single flashing yellow and the junction signal itself may display a single steady yellow aspect with junction indication for the route set. In this case, drivers must expect to find the next signal at danger. So far, we have looked at the systems of signalling and types of main running signal. Now we must look at the many other types of signal used on British Rail. Let's begin with the shunt signal. This type of signal is usually ground mounted and when cleared permits movement towards the next signal but at a speed from which the driver may stop short of any obstruction. The move is therefore cautionary. These signals usually control movements to or from the main running lines or from one running line to another. When cleared this signal displays two white lights at 45 degrees. Many shunt signals throughout the entire system are of the mechanical disc type and although there are some regional variations in detail, the display is essentially the same. By day, this type of shunt signal exhibits a red band horizontally when at danger, and at 45 degrees when cleared. By night, these signals show a single miniature red aspect when at danger, and a miniature green aspect when cleared. Where these signals are stacked one above the other, they give route information, reading top to bottom, left to right. Before leaving the shunt signal, we must look at a special form of this signal often placed at the outlet of a yard or depot. This special type of shunt signal, if of the position light type, displays one yellow and one white light horizontally when at danger. However, when in this position, the signal may be passed by a driver making a movement within the yard or depot. It is only necessary for the signal to be cleared for a movement towards the main running lines. When cleared, of course, it displays two white lights at 45 degrees.
There is a mechanical disc version of this special shunt signal which displays a yellow horizontal band on either a black or white ground when at danger. It turns through 45 degrees when cleared in the normal way. Now let's look at some position light signals mounted below main running signals. These position light signals are normally out. When cleared, they display two white lights at 45 degree disposition. Such signals are used for draw ahead movements or permissive working on platform lines. Let's have a look at permissive working on platform lines in detail. At locations where passenger trains are required to enter a platform line already occupied by another train, for example, where two separate portions of a train are to be coupled, the driver will be stopped at the signal protecting the rear of this line. After having stopped, the position light signal will be displayed together, if necessary, with route indication. The driver may now draw forward at caution, entering the platform line, but stopping short of the rear of the train ahead. At some locations, mechanical signals are still used for draw ahead and permissive working on platform lines. Although there are some regional variations, these signals usually take the form of miniature semaphore arms placed below the main running signal. By night, they display a white aspect when at danger and a small green light when cleared. Finally, a most important type of ground signal is the limit of shunt. This signal may take the form of a white floodlit board on which are inscribed the words limit of shunt or shunt limit. Or they may take the form of a position light displaying two red aspects horizontally. Limit of shunt signals must not be passed under any circumstances. Many years ago it was recognised that some form of repetition of the signalling was necessary in the driving cab. British Rail developed the automatic warning system to satisfy this requirement. Where the automatic warning system is provided on track circuit block lines, the approach to each signal is marked by two magnets in a housing in the four-foot way. The first of these two magnets is permanent, and via a receiver mounted on the train, it provokes a caution indication to sound in the cab in the form of a horn tone. However, if and only if the signal is showing a green aspect, the second magnet and electromagnet will be energised, preventing the cautionary indication from taking place, and provoking instead a bell to sound. Together with these audible indications, there is a visual indication placed on the driver's control desk called the sunflower. When passing over each AWS housing, the permanent magnet will cause the indicator to display yellow and black segments. If the second electromagnet is energized, the signal will display a green aspect. The indicator will change to an all-black display. When the cautionary horn tone sounds, the driver has three seconds to cancel this indication by depressing the AWS cancellation button. Should he fail to do so, the system will provoke an emergency application of the automatic train brake. Where the automatic warning system is applied to lines worked by the absolute block or electric token block systems, only the distance signal is provided with AWS equipment. Permanent magnets, giving a cautionary indication only, are placed at the approach to automatic open crossings and to permanent and temporary speed restrictions. On single lines where the AWS equipment may be approached in the wrong direction, a line side indicator is placed to advise the driver that he will need to cancel a cautionary horn tone. On certain urban passenger lines, predominantly those operated by London Underground and Mersey Rail, a mechanical means is provided for provoking an emergency brake application should a train pass a signal at danger. This system is known as the train stop and consists of an air-worked T-piece alongside the running rail. 
Normally held in the raised position, it is lowered by compressed air when the signal clears to a proceed aspect. A device mounted on the train, called a tripcock, should normally be in the set position, pointing down so that it will come into contact with any raised train stop. The tripcock is a simple device which, if struck by a raised train stop, will vent the train brake pipe air to atmosphere, causing an emergency brake application. Because the train stop is held in the lowered position by compressed air when the signal is cleared, it is a fail-safe system. To ensure that all trains working over train stop fitted lines have their tripcocks in the set position, tripcock testers are positioned at strategic locations. The occupation of an approach track circuit causes the TT display to become illuminated. When the tripcock makes contact with a proving ramp, the TT display is extinguished proving the tripcock to be in the set position. Many of the secondary lines of British Rail were constructed as single lines. Since trains run over these lines in both directions, a very strict procedure must be used if the possibility of head-on collision is to be avoided. The simplest system is to have a train staff, a piece of metal on which the details of the section are engraved. No driver may enter the single line section unless in possession of the train staff. This system is not very flexible, however. Train cancellation or out-of-course running will soon result in the train staff being at the wrong end of the section. The solution to flexibility in the operation of single lines came with the development of the tyre's electric token instrument. In this system, the signal box at each end of the single line has a stock of tokens which, like the train staff, are all stamped with the details of the section to which they apply. The instruments at each signal box are arranged and interlocked in such a way that only one token can ever be released at any time. The release of a token requires the cooperation of both signalmen. Let's have a look at the sequence of events as a train is signalled onto a single line worked by electric token block. The signalman offers the train to the signal box ahead in the normal way. The signalman at this box, when accepting the train, holds the bell plunger in on the last beat, thus electrically releasing the token at the offering box. The signalman in rear is now able to clear the section signal for the train to proceed onto the single line. The token is given to the driver who must check that it is the correct token for the section concerned before proceeding.
On arrival at the signal box in advance, the driver gives up the token to the signalman. He replaces the token in the electric token block instrument and gives the train out of section bell signal to the box in the rear. The procedure we have just looked at involves the issue of the token to the driver by the signalman directly. However, on certain lines operated at minimum staffing levels, a system of no signalman key token is employed. The same principle applies. The driver may not enter the single line section unless in possession of the correct token. In this case, however, the driver obtains the token himself from a no signalman key token instrument housed in a secure location at the passing place. Authority to withdraw the token is obtained by telephoning the signalman at the controlling signal box. And, of course, a token cannot be withdrawn if a token for this section is already out. The signalman at the controlling signal box controls and monitors the yes, occupation of the single line sections. Right, proceed to the dialogue when you're ready, driver. In this arrangement, there is no section signal giving authority to proceed. Instead, we have a stop board instructing the driver that he must not proceed unless in possession of the token and permission from the controlling signalman. This stop board, therefore, acts as the section signal. The approach to each token exchange point is marked by a fixed distance signal of the reflectorized board type and the subsequent hydropneumatic self-detecting facing points giving access to the left-hand passing loop are protected by a point set indicator displaying two white lights when this connection is set and locked. If the two white light indication is not illuminated, the driver must stop at the signal. The trainman must then pump the points by means of the handle provided in the adjacent cabinet. In every case where these points have been pumped, they must then be clipped and locked. Once the train has passed clear of the facing connection into the passing loop, the driver will find a board marking the end of the single line section and authority to proceed into the platform line if clear. Any connections into yards or sidings will be operated from ground frames. A facing point lock secures the connection in the normal position and the token is necessary to unlock this lever. Should a driver experience a failure of the telephone when requesting authority to withdraw a token, he will find an alternative emergency telephone for this purpose in the vicinity of the token exchange point. Where a single line is connected at one end only, in other words, a single branch line of one section, a basic block system is employed known as one train working. Quite simply, only one train is ever permitted to enter the branch. Authority to the driver to enter the single line may be simply the possession of the train staff, called one train working with train staff, or by the clearance of the section signal only, called one train working without train staff. In the latter system, the occupation of the single line is indicated in the signal box and interlocking prevents clearance of the section signal while any part of the section is occupied.
We have already seen how, in electric token block, the cooperation of both signalmen was necessary to permit a token to be withdrawn from an instrument. If this cooperative action is interlocked with the section signals at each end of the single line, whereby only one section signal may be cleared for a train to proceed in the predetermined direction, and this section signal may only be cleared for one movement, it is possible to dispense with the token, making clearance of the section signal the sole authority for the driver to occupy the single line. This system is known as tokenless block. With the introduction of radio communication between train drivers and signalmen, it has been possible to develop a new form of signalling for remote rural single lines, the radio electronic token block. Utilising computer technology and solid state interlocking, this system enables one signalling centre to control many miles of single line railway, divided into a number of sections by passing loops. Instead of the traditional metal token, an electronic token or telegram is transmitted via the radio to a data display in the driving cab. Let's have a look at how the radio electronic token block works. This train has arrived within the passing loop at a place called Speen Bridge. The driver pulls up to the stop board, which acts as the section signal for the single line ahead. He now calls the signalman by radio, giving his train reporting number and description. He must then state the train radio number. He advises the signalman of his location and requests the token for the single line section ahead. If he is in a position to issue the requested token, the signalman will tell the driver to depress his receive button. The electronic token, or telegram, will then appear as text in the data display. It will give details of the commencement and termination of the section. The driver now confirms receipt of the token and requests permission to proceed. Once permission is granted, he may pass the stop board and enter the single line. However, the driver must now look out for the station limits board and, once the whole train has passed this board, call the signalman and advise him. This most important action enables the signalman to issue a token in the rear section for a following train if necessary. On arrival at the next stop board, the driver calls the signalman, giving his location and radio number, and an assurance that the train has arrived complete within the station limits board. The signalman will now ask the driver to depress his send button. The text will disappear from the data display. The token has now been returned to the signalling centre.
Effacing connections into passing loops on radioelectronic token lines are of the hydropneumatic type with point set indicators displaying a single yellow aspect when the connection is set for the passing loop. These may be negotiated in the trailing direction and will automatically reset and relock once the train is clear. In the facing direction, no train may proceed beyond the point set indicator unless the yellow aspect is illuminated. The approach to each passing place is marked by a reflectorized type board distance signal, a braking distance in the rear. The final system of signalling which we shall examine is known as the permissive block. This system, which is never used for passenger trains, permits more than one train to enter the section. The entrance to the section is usually controlled by a miniature semaphore arm, and when this signal is cleared, the driver may proceed into the section at caution, being prepared to stop short of the rear of a preceding train. There has always been a vital need for communication between train drivers and signalmen. Sometimes, for example, in absolute block areas, it is necessary for a member of the train crew to go on foot to the signal box to remind the signalman of the presence of the train. The use of the trainman's call plunger, denoted on the signal post by the distinctive squashed D indicator, provided a fairly basic means of alerting the signalman. It simply rang a bell in the signal box. The signal post telephone was an obvious next step. It not only provided the means of alerting the signalman to the presence of the train, it enabled instructions to be transmitted. The coming of radio communications between train drivers and signalmen on certain lines has revolutionised operations. It is expected that such communications will soon be extended to cover the entire system. British Rail currently uses two different radio systems. The first, a driver-to-shore system known as Band 3, is applied to long-distance passenger and freight operations. The second, a driver-to-signalman system, has been developed exclusively for lines where passenger trains are operated by driver only. In both of these systems, communication is discrete. That is to say, it cannot be heard by drivers of other trains using the same radio channel. However, on both systems, the signalman may send out a general emergency call to all drivers. Various forms of level crossing are in use on British Rail and these fall into two basic groups. Those that are controlled from a signal box and are protected by fixed signals and those that are automatic in operation being controlled by the passage of trains. Let's have a look at the first group. Controlled level crossings are directly operated from a signal box, crossing box or ground frame situated immediately adjacent to the crossing. They may be of the old fashioned swing gate type or they may have the full lifting barriers with associated flashing road traffic signals. As we have said, this type of level crossing is protected by fixed signals, although some swing gate types on little used branch lines are protected only by distant signals, the gates themselves acting as the stop signal. Where a crossing is controlled remotely from a signal box that might be some miles away, 
a system of closed circuit television is employed. Cameras mounted above the crossing transmit pictures to the controlling signal box. Enabling the signalman to observe the crossing in the same way as if he were immediately adjacent to it. This type of level crossing, known as CCTV, is protected by fixed signals. Now let's look at the second group, those controlled by the passage of trains. The most common of these is the automatic half-barrier type, or AHB. In this type of crossing, the approaching train actuates track circuits and treadles, causing the road traffic lights to flash, bells or warblers to sound, and the barriers to lower. When the train has cleared the crossing, the barriers will again raise, unless a train is approaching in the opposite direction. This type of level crossing is not protected by fixed signals and will only operate when a train is approaching in the right direction for the running line concerned. Another form of crossing in the second group is the automatic open level crossing. This type operates in much the same way as an automatic half barrier, but has no barriers. However, as far as train drivers are concerned, there are some important differences. The approach to an automatic open crossing is marked by a black St George's cross on a reflective board. This indication is followed by a second consisting of a black St Andrew's cross, below which is a figure advising the maximum speed at which the crossing may be traversed. Finally, at the immediate approach to the crossing, there is a white light mounted at driver's eye level. This white light is normally out. Only when the flashing road traffic signals and audible warning sequence is established will this white light flash synchronously. The driver must not proceed across the automatic open crossing until he observes the white light to be flashing. In future, automatic open crossings will also be provided with a red flashing light at driver's eye level, which will operate whenever the flashing white light is extinguished. A type of level crossing found where very minor public roads or farm roads cross the railway is the type having miniature red and green warning lights provided for the road traffic. These miniature warning lights simply give indication of the approach of a train. The operation of the crossing is solely in the hands of the public. Finally, a type of level crossing found where highways cross little-used freight lines is the trainman-operated crossing. In this type of crossing, a member of the train crew closes the gates or barriers, authorizes the driver to draw forward clear of the crossing, then re-secures the gates or barriers in the open position.
So far, we have looked at the various forms of fixed signalling used by British Rail. Where a signal is defective or cannot otherwise be cleared, a hand signalman may be positioned at the signal to relay the instructions of the signalman. He will exhibit to the driver of an approaching train a red flag by day or a red hand lamp by night. When the signalman's authority to proceed has been obtained by telephone, the hand signalman will verbally instruct the driver, then exhibit a yellow flag by day or a yellow lamp by night. The driver will give one long blast on the horn, observe the instructions given to him, approach cautiously any points which are facing or any switch diamonds or swing-nosed crossing, ensuring these are in the correct position and not exceeding 15 miles per hour passing over them. He must proceed at such reduced speed as will enable him to stop short of any train or obstruction on the line.